Zechariah. We're going to do chapter 6 today. And uh, Zechariah is wrapping up the first round of his visions. I wanted to time it to where next week when Rob teaches, uh, he wouldn't have to go through anything real uh, complex in terms of visions. So uh, next week he'll do chapters 7 and 8, and uh, no visions in those chapters, so it should be pretty straightforward. And in fact, this chapter, there's one vision, and then the second half of it is an application really to all the visions. Let me read to you that first section, the vision of the four chariots. Follow along. It goes down to verse 8, Zechariah 6. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, and the second black horses, the third white horses, the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country. The white one goes after them. And the dapple ones go to the south country. And the strong horses came out. They were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. And he cried to me, behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. Now this is the vision of God to Zechariah. All right, let's walk through some of the details here. Hopefully this will help us understand a little bit uh, with with a little bit more clarity what the meaning of this text is, and then hopefully uh, we can apply this. I think it should be pretty plain, especially when we get to the second half of the chapter. This time, instead of four horsemen, it ends with four chariots. If you look at this, this section of visions, the first vision was about four horsemen. The last one, last one about four chariots. And you immediately can draw that connection and realize there's something important about the difference. And the importance is simply this. The first ones simply are patrolling the earth. These ones are patrolling the earth and dealing some justice. There seems to be a a more powerful, strong image that's given here. They indicate military might, God's power over the world. And it's four, and they're four distinct, and they're four different ones. And he talks about them going over the whole world, so we get the idea this is a worldwide sovereignty. God has this sovereignty, and he has the authority to judge and to bring justice and to control the events of this earth. Like I said, it seems that between the first vision and this one, Israel's relationship has been restored, and now it's time for God to act. The kingdom is marching forward. It's almost as though, if you think about the exile in this way, it's almost as though things go on pause for a while, although we know that this is not technically true in terms of God's economy of how He rules the world. There is no pausing. There is no momentary of Him sort of stepping away or deistic view. No, God's always involved and always marching forward. But it seems like in terms of their relationship and their activity in terms of God's kingdom, it's now been set back on course. Those, those visions of, of what God's going to do in terms of hope and encouragement, followed by visions of purity we studied last time, it put the people back in right relationship with God. And now the kingdom of heaven, now including them, marches forward. So the focus is both on God's relationship with His people as well as His worldwide justice. I don't know where this woodcut is from. I picked it out. If you ever want to know where I get my graphics for this, I know people are very deeply interested, I Google Zachariah, four chariots, and I pick something that looks sort of halfway normal and put it on there. This is a woodcut. You probably can't tell from what you see. Another detail in this, it says that they're, they're coming out between two bronze mountains, Verse 1 there, and the mountains 
were mountains of bronze. They, they come from between two bronze mountains. And I, I read a number of different commentators, and there's all kinds of guesses. Of what do these mountains, these bronze mountains mean? What's this all about? And, and again, you, people can come up with some pretty crazy stuff that has nothing to do with the text. And, and you sort of scratch your head and you say, how in the world the people in Zechariah's day were to even come up with this. And I don't think they were. I don't think they were supposed to import all this meaning into these two bronze mountains. I think the best idea is that these two bronze mountains represents the two bronze pillars of Solomon's temple. And if you, if you remember the temple in the in, inside most part, the Holy of Holies of the temple, that's where the presence of God is said to be, or the face of God is said to exist, his manifest presence. And people weren't supposed to go in there. So it's almost like those two bronze pillars in the temple represent, and these two bronze mountains represent behind of which is the, the they represent a, a guard over the, the Shekinah, the glory of God, the presence of God. And these horses, we find out, they were with God. They were waiting to go. They got command from God. They're, they're itching to go. They're, they're chomping at the bit, quite literally. And they've come from the presence of God. So I think that's the best way to understand these. I don't think we have to imp- import all kinds of bizarre meaning that, you know, relates to the future or anything. I think it's just a representation that these horses come from the presence of God. Uh, It gives us different colors of horses. And you'll notice it's in the plural. Each one of these chariots have multiple horses. We're not told exactly how many. We assume two, maybe more. Each chariot had multiple horses, red horses, black horses, white horses, and the fourth chariot, dappled horses, and all of them strong, he adds. So you get this idea that these war horses are coming out from the presence of God. I have read to my daughters uh, years ago, twice through the Chronicles of Narnia, and my younger ones, so my young ones in the family now are 8 and 11, they don't remember or they were too young the last time I read them, and so I'm reading through them again. And we are in the third book, The Horse and His Boy. Anybody ever read the, her- the Horse and His Boy? Raise your hand if you've read the Chronicles. All right, everyone needs to be raising their hand right now. You need to go read the Chronicles. They're great books. They are great books. They're fantastic. Uh, he takes basically the story of the gospel and salvation and, and makes it a story, makes it an analogy. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. I mean, there's times you're reading, I'm reading this thing and tears are coming to my eyes. But my kids don't even know, but the description of what Christ does and what he's come to do, it's fantastic. So one of the, sto- one of the main characters in The Horse and His Boy is Bree, this war horse. And it t- gives a description of how big and strong and able and capable he is. So while I was studying this week and reading about these war horses, th- I'm thinking of Bree. I'm thinking of these horses that are big and strong and powerful. And the kind of battles that would have taken place in the ancient world. You would want a certain kind of horse that had this fierceness about it. Well, that's the kind of horses that are pictured here. You can just imagine the muscles all visible and twitching and you know, foam coming out of their mouth. Mouth, They're ready to go. They want to go. God has, or is setting these horses free. I don't think we need to make much of these colors. Again, our objective is not to import all kinds of meaning that would be foreign to Zechariah or the people at that time. This is what God gave to them in their context in that era to help them. We may understand some things that were fulfilled later on to the promises there, but they had the full meaning and would have comprehended what God intended. And that's what we're after first and foremost. Again, we may see some fulfillments later on, especially when it comes to Christ. They would have known, we're going to see, they would have known ideas like the branch uh, the offspring of a woman, they would have known a king, they would have known certain things, they wouldn't have known the name Jesus Christ. We know that, uh, the fulfillment, but they would have had all the meaning they were supposed to have. And so that's what we're after. I don't think we make much of the horses other than the fact that they're distinct. These are war horses, it's a representation. If there was meaning, I don't think it's accessible. If they would have understand these different colors meaning special things, I don't think it's accessible to us. I just, the reason I say that is every commentator had a different idea of what this was. These colors mean this. This color means that. That color means this. If you look up in Jewish history, if you, and, and some of even my favorite preachers, they're bringing in stuff from the 12th century and rabbinic teachings from the Talmud of another century. Like, how in the world are these people in Zechariah's time supposed to know all that? 
They're not supposed to know all that. I, I think they just saw these horses as real horses, as varied horses. I think the varied colors represent the fact that they just went over all the earth to various places of the earth. This is what they did. These guys, these horses represent the whole earth, and that's where they went. They're distinct. They go everywhere, and they represent severe judgment. In verses, uh, begin, beginning of verse 4, I answered, said to the angel, what are these? And the angel answered, said to me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven. It's really breaths or spirits of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. Again, this idea of God's absolute universal sovereignty. It is, it is hard sometimes, I think, for Americans to realize God has total control over even the commies, communists. We don't say commies very much anymore. Sometimes we think, oh, well, God's especially here in America, or, you know, we have a special place, or this is a special country, and there's a lot of evangelicals in such and such a country. It's hard for us to imagine that God has absolute control, even in regimes that reject him. You know, the, the, the Chinese communists are starting to act more like communists. I don't even know this. The president is starting to sort of revert back to old communism, and he's very atheistic, and he's kicking out especially Christians. It's interesting. He's, he's not so hard on the Muslims, and he is hard on the Muslims in the West, but he's not so hard on the Muslims and the rest of the country. He's uh, not so hard on other religions, but especially the Christians. He's getting very hard. A lot of our, our missionaries are getting kicked out, getting questioned, and, and, and I just uh, talked to one of our missionaries a few weeks ago, and he said that uh, he and his wife, he, his friends had been kicked out of the country, another missionary friend of his, and the friend and his wife had been questioned for 40 hours. If you added up all the different, you know, over about a week, they kept on bringing him in for hours and hours of questions. And they would say things like, you know, you'll never see your children again. You know, we're gonna, you'll never see your husband again. We're separating you. We're putting you in prison. Now, they probably knew they couldn't do that. I mean, that would be a, you know, international affair if they did that. But that kind of language, they're getting back to it, back to that kind of activity and language in China at least. Um, God's still in control there. You know, I, sometimes we get this idea that if we don't have the right politicians and the right setup, we evangelicals, if it's not all set up the way we want, well, it's just, oh my goodness, we're just not going to have the freedoms, we're not going to be able to, to send missionaries like we used to, it's not, it's not going to be good for us if we don't have the right president, this, that, and we all stress about this, and I just want to say, you know, guess what, for 2,000 years, Christians have done okay, and it's because God's in control of this universe. God was in control of the Roman Empire, even when there was persecution. God has abject control over the world. And this is a very encouraging thing for the people to hear. This God who has total, abject, sovereign control of the universe, this was a comfort to them because things probably looked chaotic. Do things look chaotic? Oh, my goodness. It's constant chaos in the political and international realm now. And it's comforting to know that we don't have a God who's sort of subject to what we're doing and sort of responding to everything that's happening. No, God is on his throne, and he is in abject control. So, God has this command. God has sent them to the entire world to execute his unstoppable purposes. Patrol is no longer about surveying what's happening. Remember last time, the patrol was sent out simply to report how these people were at rest when... Judah was being persecuted. Patrol is no longer simply surveying, but executing justice, establishing peace, specifically in the north. I read multiple commentators, and I think every commentator I read had a different answer, what this actually means. This had a meaning. I believe the people would have understood what this means. Verse 6, the chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country, and the white one goes after them, and the dappled goes to the south country. She doesn't tell us where the red horses go. We do get the idea that they go patrol the whole earth, so it's not just they go to a country, but some, for some reason, there's focus on the north country. 
Now, it could have been, in just a very basic sense, they would have understood this to be maybe like what we think of as, as Turkey and Greece and that part of the world. I don't think we can push it. The people then would not have understood this to say, uh, I read one commentary said, well, clearly this is a reference to Europe because Europe later on accepted Christianity uh, far better than in other places of the world. I don't think they would have thought of Europe when they uh, thought of this. Maybe vaguely they would have thought of, of some countries like for them that existed like Greece and Asia, which would be Turkey. They may have been thinking about that, but I don't think we can push it too far. I think it meant something for them, something encouraging for them that God's message would be accepted. There would be a amount of justice but also peace, and it meant something for them that encouraged them, but I think that's the best we can say. I think that's the most we can say from our perspective. We, we're, here we are, two and a half thousand years away from them, and it's hard to know exactly how this would bring them comfort other than the fact that God would find some victory and some peace in parts of the world. All right. Here's our application. Behold the inexorable course of both justice and peace through history. Behold is a word like observe, look, inspect. Look at human history and ask, has God executed justice? Yes, he has. This is one of the arguments that Peter makes in 2 Peter, right? Peter says people are going to come along and they're going to mock Christians for believing in the coming of Christ and believing of the, the judgment of God in this world. And he basically mocks them back and says, have they forgotten the flood? I mean, God does this. God has a long, illustrious history of bringing down judgment on this earth. And he has a long, illustrious history of bringing peace. There are eras, there are generations, there are people, families, nations even, for times, eras, where God brings not just justice, but peace. And, and I think as we look at this, and it says, verse 1, I lifted my hands, and behold, four chariots came out of the mountain. I think that's, this is the shocking thing. I want you to look through history, look at this world, and notice God's control of it. Be captivated by God's control, the justice and peace that he executes. And believe, I think what he's saying, is believe that ultimate justice will be met out in the sovereign plan of God. Again, this is comforting for us, isn't it? We don't worship a God who is sort of waiting for things to happen on earth until he reacts, waiting for people to do stuff and then coming up with a plan. This is a God who absolutely controls everything, and we can see this in history. Make peace with the king before it's too late. There's an idea of this justice coming to these places. And peace ought to be made with the king. Hope in the future, completely planned and controlled by God. And trust in the promises of God yet to be carried out. They were to look forward, they were to hope, they were to trust God, they were to anticipate better days, they were to look forward, we'll see, to the branch, they were to look forward to these things, and with hope and joy, find strength. Even in the midst of a very difficult situation, their situation, as we have described multiple times, was difficult. Their country was in ruins, things were not well, other nations were in charge of them, they paid tribute to these other nations. Things weren't right, but there were promises, and these ancient promises would be kept. That's the message of this vision. All right, the next section, the crowning of Joshua at the temple, I think the best way we can think of it, and yes, I just got that by Googling Jewish crown. Um, I don't know what it says on it. There's a Hebrew word there at the bottom. It looks like it has what's called a pronominal suffix on the end. I'm restudying Hebrew right now is why I'm interested in it. 
I think it says the Lord's servants or something like that, but it's not in the same, the same word. The Hebrew that they would have used is different than, than uh, what we study, biblical Hebrew. Uh, I don't even know what this crown is from. I tried to figure out where it was from to tell you about it, but it's some sort of Jewish crown. It w- this crown would be different than the crown that we see in this passage because as we're going to see, this crown has sort of interlaced both silver and gold. It seems to be there's two crowns sort of wrapped together almost like you would twine together uh, in a tiara. These two things are sort of woven together. So let's read this passage, and then um, we'll see what happens. And the word of the Lord came to me, take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go to the same day the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown. And set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. For he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hin, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now this section is not a vision. It is what he is supposed to do, and ostensibly what Zechariah actually does. He has this little ceremony, perhaps big ceremony. And he gathers the people of Israel, and they come, and they, he collects gold from these certain people. Um, the best guess from these individuals, now the reason he mentions those individuals back up in uh, verse 10, is that these are the people who had some gold, who had maybe a charge over the treasury. If you remember, when they were sent back from Cyrus the Great many years before, uh, they gave them some gold and some help along the way. And so they would have come back from some Babylon, with some Babylonian or perhaps uh, Medo-Persian treasure. And they would have had gold and silver. And so it's likely that these men somehow were in charge of the gold and silver. And he says, I want you to take this, I want you to form a crown, and I want you to hold this ceremony where you crown the priest as king. Well, this section, you can see it as an application. It's an application of all the visions that have been said. You could say it's the epilogue or the appendix. Zechariah is now commanded to apply all that God has said with certain actions. He didn't just say, I want you guys just to feel really good about what I've prophesied. He actually wanted them to do something to demonstrate their trust in God and the fact that God had encouraged them with these prophecies, all these visions leading up to this point. Like I said, the silver and gold was two sources, the gifts of exile, the people's free will offering. The crown had two rings, silver and gold, interwoven. And it's likely a representation of the interweaving of these two offices, king and priests. And the surprising thing about this passage is that the crown is not placed on the head of a king. It's not on the head of the heir to the Davidic throne, which would have been Zerubbabel. He was the governor as appointed by the Medo-Persians. Instead, it's put on the high priest, Joshua. And this is shocking. This is startling because the people would have known this is a violation. God had divided these offices and divided them for a reason. But for whatever reason, there's something symbolic happening here. And by the way, I don't think that they were crowning him the actual king. Zerubbabel would go on and be the governor of of Israel. He, He would go on and be this. So I don't think they were actually making him king. This was a symbolic thing they were doing. They were they were doing something to symbolize truth to symbolize something that they were thinking and believing. So like I said, this is a shocking turn of events in Zechariah. It's so shocking, as I read a few of the less 
um, conservative commentators, they said, oh, this, this, is, this, mu- this doesn't belong in Zechariah. Zechariah would never have said to crown the priest. Maybe he just got the names confused a little bit, and Zechariah accidentally wrote Joshua when he meant to say Zerubbabel. He just sort of got confused here. But that would miss the whole point, I believe, of this section and of the ceremony that they were doing. The, the symbol would be lost if he was making a mistake, not to mention the fact that you would cast question on the Word of God, on the validity of the world. There's nothing archaeologically that would tell us that any other uh, thing was written down other than the fact that he was supposed to crown Joshua. Yet, uh, there is some precedent, even though this was uh, not a part of the law, this, there was some precedent. David predicted the kingly Messiah would wear the priestly garments. You read this in Psalm 10 when he talks about the one, the Lord said to my Lord, right? He talks about himself and the, the, the heir to the throne as being, you know, his heir, the one under him, has, as being his Lord. But he talks about that king that's to come from him as his Lord, as also a priest, and that he puts on these priestly garments. And, of course, we also see in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham meets this fellow Melchizedek. This guy is a king, and he's also a priest. And we come to find out later on this was, a, again, a picture of the one who was to come, Jesus Christ. This is a symbolic action, as I said, not actually crowning Joshua as king. As with Melchizedek and as with David's discussion there in Psalm 110, this is a symbol of something that's coming. The language of Zechariah, or the language God gives Zechariah here, is a branch. Of course, this takes us all the way back to the very beginning, the offspring of a woman, the shoot The seed of a woman, this branch that would grow and grow, this branch would be both a priest and a king. That is to say, the promised branch would be both the mediator between God and His people, and it would also be a powerful, just sovereign. So, they would have known, I believe, because they knew David and they knew about Melchizedek and they knew a host of other passages, they would have known in this, this gesture, this, this coronation that was happening, they would have known this is a symbol, and this is a symbol that looks forward to what they're calling a branch, the offspring, the promised one from the very beginning at the fall of man. This, this is a picture of this Messiah. And this Messiah will occupy the office of priest, mediator between God and man, and he will occupy the office of king. He will rule as a sovereign. He will be so sovereign, we learn in verse 15, those who are far off. Just pause right there. That language, those who are far off, that is one of those Men of the Word, you guys, we've studied this in hermeneutics. That's one of those common phrases you see throughout the Bible, and that is a common phrase that refers to Gentiles. Non-Jews, those who are far off, off, will come and worship this king and submit to him. And they, it says, they'll build his temple. He'll build his temple, but he's going to use these Gentiles to build his temple, and he's gathering in. And so we see this picture. Again, we see the fulfillment, right? Christ comes. He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He establishes his kingdom. He starts to build his kingdom, and we learn very quickly, very early on, that Jesus has come. His first kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus explains this, and it will have this great influx of Gentiles. His kingdom will not be confined to Jerusalem. It will be over all the earth and all these people including people living on the absolute other side of the world in the middle of an ocean. All these people will worship this king and will find their mediation, their mediator between them and God as this branch, the Messiah. So we see the fulfillment. They understood this was a symbol. This is a picture of the hope of the Messiah. 
those who are far off will be coming in to worship the Messiah as well. So that leads us to a little bit of application. I like to do, anytime I have a chance to, remind you of what's called triperspectivalism. I like to do that. Triperspectivalism is the theme throughout Scripture that Jesus is our priest, acting as mediator, that he is our king, acting as our sovereign, and that he's also our prophet. He's the ultimate revelation of God. He is the word, as John would call him. He is the one who gives truth. He is the truth, right? So anytime I can remind you of this, and of course, Zechariah in this vision touches on two of the three perspectives. So worship Jesus Christ as your prophet, which means to understand and to believe his truth. That's what we're doing in the worship hour. We're listening to Jesus' words. Someone told me many, many years ago that when you first go to a church, preach one of the gospels. Take one of the gospels and preach the gospels because even Christians don't like to argue against Jesus' words. They won't want to argue. So what did I do when I came here? You old-timers remember this? It's coming up on nine years ago. I preached the book of Mark. I preached a little series at the very beginning, but then I preached the book of Mark because I wanted to, uh, for us to deal with the words of Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'm finding a great joy in the Sermon on the Mount. You guys, I'm really enjoying this. I love the words of my Savior. And I, and I think this is this prophetorial, can I use that word? This role of prophet that Jesus is fulfilling, that he's bringing truth, he's preaching to us. And this is not just, you know, data. This is spirit-filled truth. It is truth that enables action. It motivates me. It changes me. It sanctifies me. The truth that he preaches. He preaches with authority. Authority like we've never heard before. This is not just a prophet. He is the prophet to which all the prophets pointed. His job as preaching the word and bringing God's truth to our minds and our hearts is more effective and more clear than all the prophets, even the chosen godly prophets of old. This role of prophet, of giving us God's truth, is unsurpassed, and we're enjoying this. So worship Christ as our prophet. He is the one who is the truth. Worship Christ as our priest, mediator, atoner, intercessor, fulfillment of Joshua's office, which means to trust in him, hope in, have faith in him only, is to believe in Christ. I was listening to a Ligonier podcast this last week, and one of the last things that Sproul did before he passed away was to go through these basics of Christian life, and he talks about justification by faith alone. And he describes several different things, several different aspects of our faith. And the thing that, that really stuck out to me was this idea that we have faith. He said, this is, this is what differentiated the Reformers from their Catholic forebears, that we have faith in Christ alone. The, the Catholics would say they have faith in Christ. The Catholics would even say, we, we are saved by grace. But they would say it is a grace that is merited. It is a grace that is earned by certain rituals and things. This is a faith in Christ alone. It is by looking to him and saying he is the only mediator between God and man. I cannot look to anything else to accomplish what Christ accomplished by, by living righteously on this earth, by dying an atoning death, and by being resurrected as evidence of his power over both death and sin. And so I trust Christ. I trust in Christ alone. I can do nothing to merit my salvation. He's our priest. Worship him as priest. Worship him as king. Ruler, sovereign, judge, the fulfillment of Zerubbabel, and I would say David's office. Obey, submit to, and worship him. If you think about these three perspectives, 
this is, this is the gospel, isn't it? Right? This, this is the truth of the gospel. It's believing the Word of God. And the Word of God says where, what my condition is and, and how I need a Savior. And the truth of the Word of God comes to me, and I believe it, and I, I understand it. I, I, I believe the, the, the prophet's role of Christ, and he's come, and he's told me something about my heart. And I believe it, and I follow it. I understand it. He's our priest. He says in his word that he has come as the one who has provided the righteousness and the atonement for my sin. And now I obey him. I submit to him. I worship him. I follow him. There was a a movement back in the 80s. It's not popular anymore. I don't think Chuck might know better than I do, but uh, it was this sort of anti-lordship controversy you remember the lordship controversy? And there was uh, some people, and I think they, they were really worried um, that you might teach salvation by work. So, so I think the motivation might have been clear. It came out of Dallas Seminary, and they were very worried that we might teach salvation by works. Um, so they came up with a theology. Zane Hodges and some other of these theologians came up with this theology that basically said, as long, so long as you pray a prayer of salvation you're in. It doesn't matter the kind of life you lead. It doesn't matter if you curse God. They even came up with this idea that there's this other place called outer darkness, and it's not hell, and it's not heaven. It's just sort of this other place that Christians go who have not made Jesus their Lord. And so what you really want to do, they would say, what you really want to do is after you get saved, sometime later in your life, you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. I don't know if anybody ever came across this. So there was this big controversy where some people said you know, they believed in lordship salvation. That was R.C. Sproul, John Piper, John MacArthur. They were preaching for lordship salvation, and there were the non-lordship guys. I don't think you can read the Bible and even read the words of Christ about what it is to be a disciple, to take up your cross, deny yourself, follow him. I don't think you can read the Bible and say, I can be a Christian where Jesus is not my Lord. And, and even looking at the definition of who Jesus is and these roles that Jesus fulfilled, I don't think you can say, he is my atonement, he is my priest, he is my prophet, he speaks truth, but he's not my king. No, when you repent, that's exactly what you're doing. You are submitting to the king. Now, you don't do it perfectly, and you grow. Sometimes you grow in leaps, sometimes you grow in little baby steps. Sometimes there's times when Christ's lordship over you is very obvious. Sometimes it's not very obvious. But to repent, to follow Christ, to have him as your Savior, I think it's to believe all three of these things. And that is, I believe, this is what Zechariah is pointing us to. Zechariah, in, in, in a pre-Christian, pre-New Testament way, Zechariah is preaching the gospel. He's telling us to look to Christ. I said this last week in uh, the main worship time, Zechariah knew of this new covenant that was coming, and so he appreciated the discontinuity between the old and the new, but he also appreciated the continuity, and part of the continuity is that they were saved in the same way in the Old Testament as we are in the new, the same way. They looked to Christ. They may have not known his name or known the story of the cross and all that, but they knew that a Messiah was coming who would provide atonement. He would be a prophet, a priest, and a king. We see it right here in Zechariah, and they were to look to him and trust in him him, and hope in him. And so when we read this, we get the benefit that we get to see the whole story. And we get to be in a time of new covenant when this thing has been initiated, and we see the rest of the story. We see how Jesus fulfilled these things, and we hope we do also look forward to the day when these things will be made even more real, specifically his rulership over the universe, all right? Verse 15, so far my favorite verse in all Zechariah, because this is about me, and those who are far off shall come and help build the temple of the Lord, and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. My, uh, I have four generations of, I'm the fifth, four generations of Christianity in my family. And not just Christianity, but pastors, missionaries, 
all my cousins and uncles, there's all these pastors and missionaries everywhere. Uh, before that, we were not Christians. Uh, we were explorers. There were, uh, my fan, the Ella clan was in Tennessee before the United States was even a country. Uh, my wife's family came in the 1800s, so I always ask her what it's like to be an immigrant to the United States. Um, our family were just explorers back then. They were into um, the justice world. A lot of them were justices of peace and judges and, and policemen and things like that. Before that, they were in Wales and England and probably Germany. Uh, in the Middle Ages, and before that, they were running around naked, worshiping false gods. That's probably true for all of us, right? You start going back. You may be able to have a little bit of pride about, oh, my immediate generations, but you go back very far, and your people were far off, right? And the chances, just think about the, ch- the chances of through a thousand years of history of you actually sitting here worshiping Jesus Christ is slim to none. And so you just look to God and say, thank you for bringing those who are far off into this building effort of the temple of God. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Let me praise God about it. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then Jonathan will close us in song. Lord, we thank you for bringing us who are far off Thank you for bringing us who worship false gods, who believed wrongly. Thank you for bringing us who are far off to your Son to worship Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king. I think about that ancient ceremony that was taking place there as Zechariah crowned Joshua and people understanding even then this is a symbolic gesture toward the Messiah who would come and be not only a prophet, but a priest and a king, and weave these offices together and bring all these promises to fulfillment, both for the Jews and for those of us who are far off, bringing us all together into one body. And this mystery unveiled in the new covenant that Paul talks about so often, this this union of those who are far off and God's people all together together, into the new children of God. We thank you for what you're going to do in the future, not just now, but in the future as you build your kingdom. Lord, we worship Jesus Christ. I pray again, as we always pray, that if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, I pray they would repent of their sin and trust only in Christ, not in any kind of ritual, not in any kind of church attendance or good deed, that they would look to Christ alone for salvation. Give them that faith now. All of us, Lord, we need your strength, and so we ask for it in Jesus' name.